Hi there, I'm Andy Owen. I'm the International Technical Manager for ICL Turf and Landscape, and I'm joined by my colleague, Henry Bechelet, who is the Technical Sales Manager for ICL for the UK and Ireland. We're currently presenting um, three short technical update videos with a focus on anthracnose, and this is the third in the series. In the first video, um, I chatted to Kate Entwistle from the Turf Disease Centre. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the background of the disease, its biology and pathology, and how we identify that. Um, and then in the second instalment, Henry and I talked through some of the background factors which give rise to the development of anthracnose in the sport and talked a little bit through some of the general literature which, um, which focuses on the subject. But in this third instalment, we want to drill down into the practical advice and the management of the disease practically. Um, mm. So I'll, I'll come straight in and ask you, Henry. So we're, when we're talking about managing anthracnose, what's the sort of initial conversation? What are the first few things you might say? Well, we discussed this earlier and in the previous uh, presentation, and anthracnose is one of those ones where there's kind of, um, that's in the hands of the turf manager to a certain degree. So there's lots of different factors, but a, a place you might sort of start is if we're talking about disease, is the fungicide. Um, and it's maybe not the first thing that you lean at, but it's just for the sake of discussion. Um, in the UK and Ireland, we've got this sort of Syngenta portfolio with, um, Heritage, Heritage Max, um, Instrata, Elite, and Medallion, and all of them really effective against anthracnose. Um, so, you know, there are fungicides there that can uh, that can really help and should form um, uh, a part of the thought process. Um, but as with all fungicides, they need to be used um, preventatively, don't they? You know, anthracnose. Yeah. If it's a basal rot of the disease, um, and uh, and you sort of um, already started to develop, you know, the, 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 the base of the plant's been rotted away and the leaves are starting to yellow, um, the application of a fungicide is not going to mend that. And so, and so, you know, if we, if we do consider fungicides, we need, need to use the right material at the right time, um, and the right time is before you need it on the run-up to that event. But, but there's lots of other factors as well, you know, I mean, yeah. um, this is a disease where um, our sort of management practice has a huge has has a huge impact. Yeah, the the I think the research on the fungicides is really clear, and um, I think we mentioned it briefly with Kate. You know, the primary factor is getting on preventatively. I think they say between two or even four weeks before you see the symptoms developing of that yellowing of the leaf. And um, what was clear from the research is that the fungicides are more effective, or even more effective when you have other management practices in play to reduce the stress of the turf or the surface. Um, and so, as you say, there are management practices that are in the hands of the greenkeeper to, to deploy to, to reduce the incidence of the disease. So, so um, after fungicides, or not after, but, but one of the key management practices, what would you say it would well, be? Well, I mean, turf nutrition is always kind of huge in any kind of... Um disease management strategy, isn't it? Keep the plant strong and healthy. Um, and I suppose the sort of trend in greenkeeping in UK and Ireland in, in sort of recent years has been sort of, uh, sort of a, a gradual reduction in nutrient inputs, nitrogen inputs in particular. You know, there's sort of a move to foliar feeding during the summer, for instance, maybe applying less than, than you would if you were applying sort of granular feeds. And then there's this kind of fear of applying too much fertilizer during the autumn the fear of kind of encouraging my protein patch at a later day so so you know i think in quite a lot of greenkeepers minds maybe there, there, there's this sort of desire to get below 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year average which which is quite it's you know that's kind of it's not borderline for certain grass types but for annual meadow grass it's kind of it is there and that might be sort of figuring into a, a maybe a resurgence or a constant battle against the development of that sort of the trend seems to be sort of heading towards 
you know, invoking a little bit of stress. Now, what did the research say about that? Yeah, you're you're right. Absolutely. I mean, there's there's some some clear research that focuses down on the um, these management practices, um, and we'd we'd really look at you know the work coming out of Rutgers University from Bruce Clark's research group, where they they looked at all these factors. The the research is great. It's extensive. Um, there's lots of co-authors in some of the published papers. You know, there's articles. Um, there's a range of presentations as well to view. And on nutrition, they're really clear. You know, both nitrogen and potassium play a critical part. Uh, and on nitrogen, they say that, you know, regular applications through the summer period, going into the autumn, looking at, you know, at least two to five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per week you know, for a moderate outbreak will significantly reduce that outbreak. They do recommend above that five to 10 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per week, which is- which is, That's quite know, a lot. Which is quite a lot. But they do say two to five applied regularly. So either through liquid spoon feeding or with the application of a slow release granular fertilizer, mm. you know, can make great strides in reducing the severity of any anthracnose outbreak. So I mean it doesn't have to be a prescription, does it, Andy? I mean it no. can be just sort of to, to understand the relationship between nutrition and the development of the disease. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then they follow that up with some work to show that potassium is also important uh, and you should be uh, careful not to let your potassium levels in your root zone drop too far. And, and the work was really nice, actually. They looked at levels of potassium in the root zone following a, a malic 3 extraction, and there was a cutoff point that was between 40 to 50 ppm. And as long as your K levels were, were sort of above that, they felt that, you know, anthracnose wasn't developing as often or as severely. So the recommendation from that work was clear. You know, nitrogen is important keep the potassium in your root zone and you should reduce the outbreak of the disease and um, from from the root zone analysis as well it was it was quite nice they also linked to soil ph um, they were clear to say that ph was not as critical as the key nutrients nitrogen and potassium but they did see increased incidence of anthracnose mm. as the ph dropped below sort of sort of 5.5 that level so so again that was another factor that would play its part yeah i mean that's sort of you know and just adding where the grass doesn't like it does it um um when you get sort of too acidic and and then sort of in terms of sort of you know practical advice you know regular soil analysis certainly on them i'd sort of say a sand based green maybe on an annual basis um to keep an eye on both potassium and, and, and the soil ph would sort of just give you a sort of sense of whether you needed to sort of um, try and make any changes or just certainly sort of um, um, give you a sort of sense of the level of risk of a, of a disease uh, yeah. attack developing, we would always recommend. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so yeah. but I mean, there are, there are, sort of, there are, I mean, it's a brilliant piece of work, isn't it? Or, um, yeah, yeah. Um, coming out of Rutgers and there were some other factors that they identified and um, top dressing, was one and that's kind of like the, the sort of the amount of top dressing but also the timing of your top dressing had sort of a, a huge influence what did they find out Andy? yeah top dressing was was critical as well and i think in some very early research the suggestion was that top dressing could increase the instance of anthracnose you know they they disproved that completely they showed that top dressing was an important management practice to reduce anthracnose levels they were recommending about five tons per hectare every two weeks through the summer if that's possible you know trying to get 80 tons of top dressing on over the course of the year um i think the work on that was was fairly clear um you know they did you know they did recognize that sometimes it's difficult to apply top dressing through the playing season on a very busy course or with limited staff and they said in those cases you know a heavier application in the spring was more effective than a heavier application in the autumn at reducing the severity of the disease and and they were talking about about 40 tons 
over the over the greens in the spring would be a good target to aim for and that amount was better applied in the spring than in the autumn so top dressing was clear and um, i remember seeing seeing bruce clark present very clearly he felt that the application of top dressing was protecting the crown of the plant um, mm. and that protection of the crown of the plant just reduced the stress on the plant a little bit and potentially that reduced stress um you know reduce the incidence of the disease and certainly by by protecting that crown of the plant and putting regular top dressing in you might make your mowing practices more effective um and you know mowing was another critical mm. practice that they brought up you know and the height of cut at which you mow is important as well uh, what have what have been your observations on that over the the past few wow. years well, we there's been lots of discussion about heights of car, haven't there? Um, the great two mil debate that we had, um, and and of course mowing is a kind of a key factor when it comes to sort of uh, the production of playing qualities. You know, if we sort of go back to the sustainability debate or the two mil debate, whatever it was, playing qualities won. You know, that was the sort of yeah. uh, that was the thing, and and over the sort of um, uh, I suppose over the time, uh, you know, cutting heights have sort of reduced. I don't, I don't necessarily believe that they're sort of reducing on an ongoing basis, but they're certainly a lot lower than they they used to be on a routine basis. Um, and um, you know, you just got to think, well, that does have a place a place stress on the sword, and and uh, you know, I would think that that would have a massive influence on the level of. Anthrax knows. What did the what did the sort of um, research study say about that? Yeah, I think I think you're right there. I think when a lot of the textbooks would would say straight out that the reduced height of cutting for longer periods through the summer in more recent years has led to a greater instance of anthracnose. Um, you know, the the work was was really really good. They were they were just contrasting. Uh, a relaxing of cutting height from 2.3 millimeters to 3.2 millimeters. So that change or that increase in cutting height had a significant effect on the anthracnose. So it did significantly reduce the instance. So going from 2.3 up to 3.2, and just that alone was significantly reducing your anthracnose. Yeah. But you know, even at 3.2, there was lots of anthracnose about. You know, we can, um, as we say, show a significant reduction, but not a, a complete eradication of the disease. And this is where all that research out of Rutgers, all that anthracnose research was so good because it, it didn't just focus on these discrete factors and nutrition, top dressing, height of cut, how they affected the disease it also then looked at the interactions between those factors and showed the importance of combining your cultural practices to give an effect and we've seen that ourselves haven't we in some trial work yeah no you sort of yeah we've some we've come to understand integrated turf management a lot better but you know that there's all, all the idea that sort of um individual treatments can sort of have a certain level of benefit but it, it, and it, it might be significant but usually it's sort of um it's partially um effective but when you pull things together um um or co uh, combine things that you know have benefits then then that the, they sort of compound the, the benefits compound themselves um and can become extremely effective and um and that's borne out in this work, isn't it? I mean, when they moved on yeah. to sort of look at the interactions between mowing, top dressing, and nutrition, all of a sudden the differences became really, really. Good. Yeah, that's it. And the, uh, I really like the work. It was it was really neat. They they compared effectively applications of nitrogen um, from 100 kilograms per hectare per year to 200 kilograms per hectare per year. Uh, they looked at top dressing from 40 tonnes to 80 tonnes per hectare per year. And then they looked at height of cut, you know, from this level of 2.3 up to this level of 3.2. And they looked at the interaction of all those factors. So they were never comparing to a control 
they were comparing to to essentially what might be considered best management practice and what mm. might be considered to be a slightly more stressful practice. Yes. Um, and the, the results were really clear. There was one graph that really stands out where you had, you know, the, the incidence of disease up the one axis and then you had, you know, your, your time over the other and you looked at the, the, the interactions of them all and at the top, the, you know, the steepest slope, the most anthracnose was at the lowest level of those three factors, you know, the least nitrogen, the, uh, the least top dressing and the lowest height of cut. And then as you changed those factors, as you uh, relaxed your height of cut or as you increased your top dressing or as you increased your rate of nitrogen, you decreased the amount of anthracnose that they were seeing on the surface mm. um, and it was really clear and the combination mm. yeah the combination of the best management practices you know was so much better than the you know the three lower levels it was it was astounding so you know at 200 kilograms of n at 80 kilograms of top dress sorry 80 tons of top dressing per hectare per year and at a height of cut at 3.2 mils, you know, you could keep your anthracnose down at below 10%. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, they were up at sort of 50% 50, 50 of the surface being affected. So a huge reduction. Those little tweaks make, just made a, a huge difference, didn't they? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Of course, Brilliant. all those practices have an effect on the playing quality of the surface, which as we know is, is important as well. And um, and they did well. I don't know. I'll pass it back to you. Which do you think they found was the was the the most critical, or least critical in terms of in terms of the practice to carry out? Oh, well, I, I I don't know. The least critical. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think I mean they're all fairly critical, but I, th I think the sort of uh, the, the the sort of point of your question was you know if you're in a situation where you you know you can't compromise on playing quality. I think what they sort of said was, is, 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 um, you know, well, you know, do your best management practice, top dressing and nutrition, and um, the least deterioration would occur if you sort of um, had had your sort of low height of cut. You know, that, that that there was sort of this kind of almost like reality check, or just sort of saying that we understand that you know yeah. you've got to maintain ball roll distances. Um, so yeah, if you keep everything else in place, you know, those heights of cut needn't be so damaging but there was still a sort of um, a price to pay for it in terms yeah. of yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, and they yeah they did show actually in another piece of research that you can you know double cut on the same day at a higher height or cut and roll yeah. and that would not increase the instance of anthracnose but that does protect you know your stint meter readings or your your roll distance to to try and maintain that quality you know if that's possible we know that in every situation that isn't isn't possible but um you know it was was a nice piece of work for that so yeah. so you know i think I'd, I'd recommend to to anybody to dig out that work from rutgers that bruce clark has, has published you know going on for the last you know i don't know 10 or 12 years really there's some really seminal pieces of research there for people to read to help understand how these factors interact um certainly it, great for me to top up and read through every now and again just to get a, a sense of that um and, and that's probably all we need to to cover here isn't it henry i think you know we we've, we've had these three short technical sessions on anthracnose you know we, we've looked at the identification and the you know how the disease occurs uh we've looked at you know factors that give rise to the disease on the surface and exacerbate it you know and in this one you know these these management practices that can be put in place to reduce the instance of the disease you know it is clear that you know no matter what surface you're managing you know you you don't have to be at the mercy of anthracnose there are integrated practices that you can employ you know that will include you know judicial use of a fungicide at the right timing to help you manage through that period but 
you know, there are management practices that are very much in the hands of the course manager, you know, about top dressing, you know, decisions on height of cut, decisions on the nutrition that's going on that enable you to to manage or mitigate the, the effects of the disease quite yeah. successfully. Have you got any yeah. concluding marks before we finish off? No, that's good advice, Andy, isn't it? You know, it's just kind of, um, you know, understand the disease and put together your management practice to, to sort of try and reduce the conditions that favour its development. Integrated yeah, disease management. Integrated disease management. Well, I hope those watching have found or listening have found that interesting. Um, you know, I hope you've picked up the other videos in the series. Um, keep your eyes out i think henry and i will do a few more of these we're very happy to get some feedback um on how they've done uh watch out for the webinar we'll be hopefully doing in a few weeks time and the quiz we'll push out oh, on yeah. social media with a focus on track mouse and um we'll leave it there thanks very much yeah see you again <laughs>